All right. Um, our guest is a little early and better early than late, or better, better early than never. Um, I'd like to um, tell you a little about uh, our guest that we're about to have on, um, Fry Gillier. He's a historian, a journalist, a writer, um, in residence at the University of Alabama. As a renowned author for over 40 years, with over 40 years experience, he's written over 25 um, books. Um, added, uh, his most recent book, Hard Rain America's, in a Hard Rain America in the 1960s, is a comprehensive look at every aspect of the decade from the art to the military conflict and the political fractures <clears throat> that formed the United States during this period. It is this book that we are about, uh, that we brought him on Real Talk to talk about today. Mr. Gilliard. Yes, hey. Okay, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be, glad to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Now, uh, we're going to jump right in. Um, you know, I know you're a little pressed for time, so we're, we're going to uh, jump right in. Now, um, okay. Hard Rain makes a strong effort to ground its, its um, content in both history and your personal relationship in the 60s. I want to start by asking, what makes the 60s particularly distinct to you and why the events are still important, even for those who didn't live in, uh, you know, that didn't live through uh, the 60s? Okay, for me, it was kind of a coming of age decade. I went from being a junior high school kid uh, to being a college graduate and starting a career as a journalist by the end of the decade. And somewhere along the way in there, uh, I realized how historic it was. I think. One of those times when um, was when I, in 1963, I was on a high school field trip uh, from Mobile, uh, where I grew up, uh, to Birmingham. And it so happened that the day we got there, this April day, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. King, was leading a civil rights march. And he was arrested, like, right in front of where I was standing as I walked out of the hotel where we were staying. And I saw the look on his face, and, and the look of, of, of maybe sadness or, or something in his eyes that just struck me uh, as a very human thing in the midst of this, of, of this turbulence. And um, somehow, I don't know, as a, as a teenager, I, I just never escaped that feeling and, and the sense that important things were happening. And, uh, when I started to write this book a few years ago, it, it occurred to me that some of the issues that I thought we had dealt with in the 60s, uh, particularly issues of, of race in this country, were coming back around again. I thought we might be losing ground on some of the gains we had made, and, and so I wanted to write about the lessons and warnings of, of another dramatic time and see if it made us think about today. Okay. Now, in your book, you know, uh, you're, you're careful to view politics in terms of not just politicians, but movements. Now, you're careful to give attention to movements that don't normally get mentioned. Uh, what made you present <clears throat> and see the anti-war protests, the struggle for uh, women's liberation, gay rights movement, civil rights movement, as similarly significant and formative uh, for this period? Well, one of the things was that it seemed pretty clear to me that a lot of movements drew their inspiration from the civil rights movement. Um, one of the first things that happened in the decade of the 60s was that the sit-in movement began uh, a lot of times in college towns uh, where African American students would go down to lunch counters that were segregated um, not just to buy a hamburger, but to assert their humanity and their dignity and their right to be there. Started in Greensboro, North Carolina, and spread quickly to Nashville and more than 50 other cities around the South. And the pure idealism of that, the sort of, the sort of hope and determination and bravery that those students exhibited uh, quite easily inspired uh, uh, the, the women who began to protest uh, about uh, a lack of equal pay for equal work or uh, gender roles that seemed too confining or 
And then when the war in Vietnam gained momentum, the uh, the anti-war uh, students, uh, you know, I remember them talking about the, the, the civil rights protests and and, uh, and what they could learn from that. And, and it kind of spread from there. Cesar Chavez in California organizing farm workers, uh, often Mexican-American, Filipino-American farm workers there, um, uh, you know, using the nonviolent tactics and ideals of Dr. King. So, um, so there, there just seemed to be a linkage there. Um, uh, and some of the, the uh, for example, the leader of the free speech movement at Berkeley, a guy named Mario Savio, in 1964 had worked in Freedom Summer in Mississippi for the civil rights movement. So there's a very direct inspirational connection there too. So I just think the civil rights movement was the first point of inspiration spread to to these others, which you know raised their own important issues. Okay. Now uh, your focus on um, racial politics is extends both past Jim Crow and the civil rights movement, and on on and on its aftermath with black out with the black power movement, the black. transformation of SNCC. And Martin Luther King's efforts with the Poor People's Campaign, which ultimately led to his assassination. As the book makes some effort to grapple with hope, what do you think the trajectory these movements took says about the possibility of hope? Well, I think that um, I think that that people continue to hope uh, throughout the trajectory of these movements. But I think anger uh, set in also, impatience, uh, understandably. These were young people in many cases who were uh, who were demonstrating for and demanding equal rights. And when um, when there were some gains, but 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 racism still seemed to be so much in the air. Um, you know, there was an anger that began to express itself uh, in in, uh, in uh, calls for black power. And, you know, black power meant a lot of things to different people. Uh, in, um, you know, in Lowndes County, Alabama, uh, where uh, the Black Panther became the, uh, the, became the symbol of voting rights, uh, black power meant the right for everybody to vote and to uh, exercise their political power in polls where African Americans were in a majority. Uh, but that symbol of the Black Panther uh, Became a, a, a symbol of racial pride that was, uh, you know, that was exported to California in the Black Panther movement uh, for self-defense. There, um, you know, drew some inspiration from these rural African American folks in Lowndes County, Alabama, and you know, they were determined to protest police brutality and those kinds of, of issues, which were, which was a pervasive issue uh, then as now. Uh, in many inner cities in the country. So, um, uh, you know, it was uh, people confronted the issues where they lived and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, borrowing what they could from people uh, in other places who had confronted similar but not identical issues, I think. Uh, the 60s uh, that you describe uh, are shaped by the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and uh, anti communism as a backdrop. But in your book, you give a charitable and fair emphasis to socialists and communists like Michael Harrington, Angela Davis, and Fred Hampton. Uh, what did their politics capture about the aspirations of the 60s and about the diversity of thought within the left at the time? Well, I think that, I think that um, there was a, uh, a, they all shared a, um, a, a radical commitment to social justice. Uh, Michael Harrington was a socialist who, uh, wrote a book called The Other America right. about poverty in America, uh, and an America that many of us didn't see or deliberately uh, avoided looking at, uh, and, and he made the point that poverty was uh, was multiracial, uh, that, that, that there were more uh, poor people who were white than, than, any, than any other uh, ethnic group, but that it disproportionately affected people of color. And so, uh, so he made us think about about economic justice. I think very early in the decade, this book came out in 1962. Um, Angela Davis began her own personal trajectory in Birmingham. Uh, she was radicalized both by 
by reading socialist philosophers, but also by the Birmingham church fund, because she knew those girls who were killed there. Uh, and so she continued to move uh, left and to, uh, and to uh, continue to demand, um, to demand justice and power for people of color. Um, and also for women, she was uh, she was uh, increasingly concerned about gender inequities in the, in the country. Um, and then Fred Hampton is one of the most interesting figures of all. I think he was a Black Panther leader in Chicago, and and he believed in interracial coalitions to deal with nitty gritty issues that were affecting. Uh, uh, often people of color in the inner city, Puerto Ricans, uh, uh, African Americans, whatever. But he also made common cause with Appalachian whites in Chicago who had come from places like West Virginia and found themselves uh, on the receiving end of police brutality and other things that uh, African Americans had faced. And what um, um, one of the one of the, uh, one of the uh, the Appalachian white uh, groups that made common cause with the Panthers actually wore the emblem of the Confederate flag on their hats, uh, and that didn't bother Fred. He said, "You know, we're we're all facing the same kind of issues," and the white guys agreed. And, and uh, so it was interesting the kind of uh, uh, the kind of multiracial coalition that he was beginning to build when he, when police broke into his apartment and killed him. And there was really very little doubt that it was uh, an officially sanctioned murder of this uh, young man who, uh, uh, who, was, who was trying to do these things in Chicago. So, you know, fa fascinating, um, fascinating stories. The Hampton uh, killing was investigated uh, thoroughly and, uh, uh, and, and it was not a pretty, pretty sight what happened there. So, anyway, I'm glad you brought up those folks because they were also very much a part of the movement, just as uh, Dr. King or Robert Kennedy, right. uh, and of course Malcolm X was uh, uh, was was really important too. That sort of uh, any means necessary, but I'm not spoiling for a fight uh, kind of stance that he took uh, was inspirational as well. Absolutely, and I appreciate your answer as well. Uh, one other question I have for you is that uh, one thing that struck me about the book is that despite the North's progressive reputation, many of the eruptions in the 60s were started in or influenced by the South's example. Uh, is that a fair reading? And if so, why do you think the South, which is often considered a conservative, ended up being so pivotal to the creation of new progressive and left movements? I think that's a really good question, and I, that is my perspective. Uh, some people have wondered if I, if if the fact that I am a Southerner sort of colored my perspective in that regard, and I suppose that's possible. But when you look at things like like the um, uh, like the, the origins of the sit-in movement, that's right. the origins of SNCC, yep. um, you know, the, those guys started in the South. And you look at the uh, uh, the importance of events in Birmingham and uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer and um, um, you know those uh, the the uh, uh, the fact that Dr. King was was murdered in Memphis. I mean, there was just uh, there was just no doubt about the fact that the South played a major role. Um, why that is, um, you know, maybe it's because because we know social injustice in the South. It's so it's so it's been so clear and, and kind of so black and white, if you will. Um, you know, the uh, we had legal segregation in the South. So uh, you didn't have to be, um, you know, you didn't have to be brilliant to see that, uh, that this was a place that started confronting racial injustice, for example. And, um, you know, parts of the 60s movements that occurred in other places, uh, free speech, for example, which is identified with California, rightly so, Berkeley and other places, uh, but it also played out at uh, southern universities like uh, Vanderbilt, where I was a student, when Stokely Carmichael came and spoke there uh, in 1967. There was a movement to fire the chancellor of the university who allowed a student group that I was part of to bring Stokely to campus. Um, and so we had to fight that battle there at Emory University in, uh, uh, in Atlanta. 
Uh, they fought a battle over free speech because uh, Thomas Altizer, the death of God theologian, was on their uh, was on their religion faculty, and some people uh, wanted uh, him fired, and the president refused to do that. So, you know, there were just a, a, the the South is just no. I don't know why for sure, except that we had a lot to protest in the South, and so and so it happened. I think. All right. Well, you know. Uh, also, you know, throughout your book, um, politicians like John F. Kennedy, uh, Linda B. Johnson, and even mayors like Richard Dale, they end up being shown as compl conflicted figures who either have personal opinions uh, that they have limited political room to express, or we have dragged or have been dragged by the moments in, into adopting politics that they, they wouldn't normally accept. To what extent? Is there a reluctance, a reflection of whites and blacks having competing interests during this period? Well, that's a really that's a really good question. You know, it's uh, I mean, take uh, take John Kennedy for example. Um, you know, you could argue that he would never have been president at all if not for the black vote. Uh, he won a higher percentage of it than uh, than than the previous Democratic candidate, Adlai Stevenson, had won in either 1952 or 56. Kennedy won in 1960. Uh, and yet, Kennedy uh, felt the realities of politics or interpreted them in such a way that he that he came much more slowly to an embrace uh, of civil rights legislation, for example, uh, the movement uh, led by Dr. King and others uh, would have wished. They were very frustrated with him. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, he, he did, he did, he was moving in that direction very clearly in 1963. When George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door in June of 1963, John Kennedy made one of the strongest speeches in, uh, in pursuit of or in defense of the ideal of, of civil rights that an American president had ever made. Uh, calling it an issue as old as the scriptures, a moral issue as old as the scriptures, and asking who among us whites would be content to have the color of our skin changed in this country. Um, Lyndon Johnson, um, who had, was raised a southerner, uh, also came reluctantly to the cause of civil rights, and yet, uh, you know, he pushed through the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right. and Voting Rights Act of 1965, and Open housing laws and uh, uh, and, and uh, sort of more colorblind legislation like Medicare that, that was intended to improve the health of all Americans, including those on the margins. Uh, and yet, in the end, all of that was undone by the realities of Vietnam, or at least his legacy was he was remembered as much for Vietnam as he was for the embrace of, of, of civil rights. So you know, co politics are complicated. People are complicated. Uh, human morality is sometimes complicated, and, and none of these, none of these figures, uh, you know, come, come out historically unscathed. Uh, and yet, I would argue that, uh, that, the, that the Kennedy family, for example, um, uh, evolved in the direction where you had one of the richest, most privileged white families in America, deeply concerned with people on the margins. I think that. Robert Kennedy embodied that quite powerfully in the five years that he lived after his brother was assassinated. Uh, Robert Kennedy uh, went to uh, to African American ghettos. He went to American Indian reservations. He went to uh, to support the farm workers in California. Uh, he also went to uh, white working class. Uh, neighborhoods in the Midwest or, or coal fields in West Virginia. And wherever people hurt, he seemed to understand that, maybe because he hurt so badly himself in a personal way after after his brother was killed. And, uh, but he had to tell an African-American crowd in, in uh, Indianapolis that Dr. King had been killed. Uh, probably only, uh, may, may well be that Robert Kennedy was the only white man who could have done that in America and, and somehow reached out uh, to that crowd with words of comfort in, in an honest way. So, you know, again, complicated figures, complicated times. So. 
Right. And, and you know, um, I appreciate you mentioning that because I, I was going to ask you to uh, speak about uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Kennedy. But uh, how about tell us a little bit about the school you graduated from, from Vanderbilt in Tennessee? Right. I went to Vanderbilt. I got there as a freshman in 1964. And it was a Southern University, you know. It was uh, the, the first class of African American undergraduates uh, got there the same year that I did. And these were extraordinary young men and women. And I remember uh, conversations about race that I had with some of them. I had, I had never been in school with a person of color, uh, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, and so, uh, and so part of that was my own learning curve on these kinds of issues. Um, and then Vanderbilt was a place, though, where, uh, where a student organization uh, very actively brought in important speakers from outside, you know, from the world at large. I remember one of the first, my, my early memories at Vanderbilt when I was a freshman was uh, a day when Roy Wilkins, the, the executive director of the NAACP, uh, spoke back to back with Governor George Wallace of Alabama. And the contrast between the dignity and erudition of Mr. Wilkins and the sort of coarse, um, really the coarse racism of, of Governor Wallace, governor of my home state, was so striking. And I remember a uh, a friend of mine, another white guy from Alabama, uh, looked at me after Wallace finished talking and he said, I don't want to be on that guy's side. And, and so, you know, if we were kids. It was a personal thing. It was a visceral thing. We were absorbing kind of the lessons of the world in this semi-cloistered place where we had the freedom to think about it. And for me, it was life-changing. Um, you know, things I guess I should have already known, but I finally had a chance to figure out and college. And so my way of uh, connecting with those bigger issues was that I wanted to write about them. Um, I was never as much of a joiner as I wish I was. And so I, I wasn't so much a movement activist as I, as I was somebody who wanted to write about that stuff. And really that's kind of what I've done, I've done ever since. So Vanderbilt was very formative for me. It was a place where I could think more freely for myself and, and uh, figure out what I thought about the world and figure out who I was. Um, and, and, and that turned out to be who I was. You know, I've often wished that I had had more of an activist gene, that I had wanted to be, you know, the front lines of demonstration. And I was there sometimes, but I was taking notes instead of participating, you know. So that's just kind of how it worked out. It was a great place to be. It was flawed like all institutions are. Still more conservative than it should have been. But we had a great chancellor, the president of the university, who was just a terrific man who, who liked the fact that the students there were confronting these important issues. So it was a great place. On a different note, uh, your book's efforts to synthesize and recreate the chaos of the 60s uh, also seeks to chronicle its artistic literary and recreational movements. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of art to the sense of transformation of friction in the 60s and how its various artistic movements gave imaginative space to the protests we saw? Yes, I think that's a, that to me seemed like a very important dimension of the movement. And uh, whether it was visual artists, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Romare Bearden, who uh, was born in North Carolina, but was part of the Harlem Renaissance, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, did these powerful collage paintings, uh, uh, sort of depicting the power of African-American community and culture, whether it was, whether it was that kind of art, uh, whether it was uh, the, the quilters of Gee's Bend, Alabama, who, uh, who made these remarkable works of art with a utilitarian purpose to stay warm in the winter and the world discovered the beauty of, of their of their art and their craft and so quilt making became uh, a means to at least some steps toward the economic liberation of, uh, of people in that part of, uh, of 
Alabama, or uh, you know, or, or whether it was uh, uh, you know uh, uh, vocal artists, uh, musicians like uh, you know, like Nina Simone or Sam Cooke singing "A Change Is Gonna Come," or uh, or, or white artists like. Uh, Bob Dylan, Pete Seeger, John Baez uh, singing their protest songs, or, or for that matter, uh, for that matter, Johnny Cash, a country musician in uh, Nashville who became known as the Man in Black because he sang about people on the margins. You know, I think all of that uh, contributed to a uh, to a sense of uh, you know of, of cultural awareness and, like you say, gave space for for others to think and act. Uh, uh, you know, in, in a more activist way. One of the last uh, scenes depicting uh, depicting uh, music in a book was Jimi Hendrix, maybe the greatest rock and roll guitarist, uh, African American, uh, uh, playing uh, the Star Spangled Banner uh, at Woodstock, uh, solo on his electric guitar, doing it in a way that nobody had ever done it. Maybe trying to invoke Vietnam, uh, but but when Dick Cabot on a late night talk show uh, asked him why he had done such an unorthodox version, uh, he said, "I didn't think it was unorthodox. I thought it was beautiful." And and so you know what does what does that mean? What was Hendrix trying to say to us? Uh, taking the most uh, patriotic anthem and, and making it his own in a kind of counterculture protest kind of way, and yet. Uh, and, and yet honoring it at the same time that he, that he claimed it in a different way. You know, all those artists did, the, the, the brilliance of their imagination, I think, is something that we are still left to ponder even today. Throughout your book, and particularly in the last quarter, uh, I feel like the hope you tried to, uh, uh, to see uh, and the hope you tried to see reflected in figures and movements uh, became difficult to sustain with the evidence that those movements were either failing or weakening. Uh, why do you feel that hope is politically essential, and do you see similar embers of possibility of movement making today uh, that you saw then? Well, I think you're right in, in sensing that hope was harder to just to say. You know, we we uh, we saw people who inspired that hope being killed. Right. right. Um, Malcolm X, um, Dr. King, Robert Kennedy, and so it it, it did become harder. Um, and, and yet there were people who kept going even when these iconic larger than life figures were not on the scene. And, uh, and you know, and, and for a while, uh, you know, in the in the 1970s, you saw things like uh, New South governors stepping forward in in, uh, in Georgia with Jimmy Carter, and uh, Florida with Reuben Askew, and, and uh, Virginia with Linwood Holton, who was a Republican, but all of them invoking the lessons of the civil rights movement uh, in talking about how the, the South and the nation could move forward. And so I really thought that that, uh, that, 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 that hopeful uh, stream of the political consciousness of the 60s uh, had continued beyond the 60s. And, and there were there have been times since then that I thought I've seen it again. I mean, with the election of Barack Obama in 2008, I felt a, a kind of hope that I had not felt maybe since the uh, assassination of Dr. King and Robert Kennedy. And yet there was that same kind of rhetoric and that same kind of sense of common cause, um, um, you know. And and, and yet, um, you know, there was also this racial backlash against President Obama that uh, reminded me that the 60s had also been a time when uh, politicians like George Wallace learned to exploit the grievances and rage uh, on the other side of the spectrum. And when um, advisors to President Nixon said the, uh, the key to politics is understanding who hates who. Um, and so the, the, the utility of stoking division in the country for political gain was also one of the themes emerging from the 60s. And good Lord, we see that today. Uh, just, just to a level that I had not thought was possible. Uh, with, uh, I mean, I'll go ahead and step on some toes, but um, uh, the divisiveness coming at us from very high places, 
including the White House today, just just staggers me. I cannot believe we're still dealing with that as if George Wallace were elected president in 1964 or 68 in terms of the divisive rhetoric uh, that has a that has a racial component that inflames our immigration debate and other things. And, uh, um, and so and so I look for the hope on the other side. I look for the figures who can inspire us uh, the way some of them did in the 60s. You know, there are some uh, young people in movements and things, the uh, Black Lives Matter, and the, the March for Our Lives, uh, Me Too, those kind of things. Uh, people are, you know, it, 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 we hope it will trickle up, you know, that the hope that it inspires those movements and the necessity of change, too, in that field. That will trickle up because poison is trickling down. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, we're, we're about at the end of our interview, uh, Mr. Gaylor. Is there anything else you want us to know about your book? Any upcoming projects you may be working on? Well, I, I, first of all, let me just say I appreciate the thoughtfulness of these questions. Um, I've done a lot of interviews, and they don't always, uh, the questions aren't, aren't always as. as uh, as provocative and thoughtful as these, so I thank you for that. Um, I think you. we've covered the. Uh, I think we've covered the book, uh, um, you know, um, as well as it can be, can be covered in a thirty-minute period. The the next project I have coming up is very different. Um, it's a children's book that I've co-written with another writer named Marty Rosner, um, and it's uh, it's for elementary school children, but it tells a forgotten story of the first African-American member of Congress from Alabama, a man named Benjamin Turner, who was elected during Reconstruction. And he had a kind of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King sensibility in which he demanded uh, equality after emancipation, but also uh, did not want to see his white neighbors punished for uh, their part in the Civil War. He wanted to bind up the wounds and move forward together and offer this kind of interracial vision of what the future could have been. And his vision didn't carry the day, but we're left to imagine how much better off we it might have been if it had. So I want to I want to start to work on some projects to hopefully get kids thinking at an early age. White and black kids about uh, about our troubled heritage, our hard history, and yet the fact that it has produced inspirational figures that might inspire us today. So that's the next project. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, Mr. Gay, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on Real Talk. Uh, we're broadcasting this on Facebook as well. I'm holding up your book. Uh, his book is Hard Rain, A Decade of Hope, Possibility, and Innocent Loss. Now, Mr. Gary, I, I would really, really like to thank you for taking time out to come on and discuss your book. And uh, keep on writing. If you can't be a part of it, like you said, if you're not a joiner, uh, we appreciate the fact that you documented um, documented the uh, events as they happened without too much of your own personal slant. It's, it's, very, it's a very good read. And it's good to see when people report what they see as opposed to putting their own slant on things. They you see know. research. Right, right. You know, you. It, it seemed very, very factual and very on point. And we appreciate that uh, from your book. So I'm going to encourage people to go out and pick up your book, Hard Rain, um, Our Decade of Hope, Possibility, and Innocence Lost. And Mr. Gaylord, thank you so much. Gaylord, I'm sorry. And that's Fry Gaylord. Um, we appreciate you coming on Real Talk today, and hopefully we'll be in touch with you on your uh, future projects. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Okay. All right. And again, you're on live with Herschel, Real Talk with Herschel, WKCG 99.1 on your FM dial.